Up until now, we just considered a vector field P a function of x, y, which manifested as only having an i hat component. Now what we will do is we will consider a separate vector field Q a function of x, y. But this is only going to have a j hat component. And we're going to consider its action along the same line integral C. And having looked at what happened with the vector field P, we'll see if we can infer the results for the vector field Q. Once again, we are going to break up the vector field C into two different paths, namely x1 of y and x2 of y. Now the point here is that the vector field Q has no i hat component, so this section Q sub x will go to zero, but Q sub y is non-zero. So Q really just is Q sub y in the j hat direction. And just for convenience, I'm going to rewrite this as capital M j hat. So Q manifests as Q sub y j hat, and I'm just going to call it M j hat. That's that's kind of the uh, the general thing which people do when discussing Green's theorem. dr doesn't change, and it's still dx i hat plus dy j hat plus dz k hat. And once again, we're going to consider the closed line integral around C inside the vector field Q. Q has no i hat component. Therefore, the only procedural difference between this particular integral and the previous closed line integral which we performed is with the limits. C is, is anti-clockwise, and this means that the positive direction is considered to be anti-clockwise. So what we did when we discussed the closed line integral of p dot dr, we went from x min is equal to a to x max is equal to b, and then from x max is equal to b to x min is equal to a. And we saw that we, in order to have the limits the same, we negated one of these and put b up top and a down below, and we were able to amalgamate the integrals. The y limits will be similar but different. We will go from y min, which is equal to e, to y max is equal to f on the first part of the curve, and then from y max is equal to f to y min is equal to e. Once again, then, we will swap the limits on 1 and negate it, and add the components into a single integral. Let's look at this graphically. So we have the same curve on the same plane. We note that we have x min is equal to a down here, and x max is equal to b. So in the previous integral, we went from here to here and back around. Now what we are going to do is go from here to here and back around. So, looking at our closed line integral, going anti-clockwise, q dot dr is going to have only a j hat component. Well, it's actually going to be dimensionless, or it, sorry, it's going to have no direction, but the j hat components will be the only ones that count. So we have m dy. So we have two sections of integral, going from e to f, and then from f to e. Now note, by the way, from e to f, we're integrating x1 of y and y, but from f to e, we're integrating x2 of y and y. And this is important. It is opposite to what we had seen in the past. When we discussed p dot dr, the first component we had x, we had y1, and we had y2. Now I know you might say this is a matter of the order, but you'll see why it's important to note which is which. So, the first part of the integral we're going to keep the same, and we're just going to bring, bring it down here and rewrite it. So of course it's going to be a positive integral. But we're going to swap the limits on the second integral, therefore negating it. And we're going to invoke the fundamental theorem of calculus, just like we did in the past. However, this time we're going to have x1 of y on top and x2 of y on the bottom. Whereas when we discussed p, we actually had y2 of x on top and y1 of x on the bottom. So just be careful with this because it could cause confusion. 